I'm Pierre Legendre from the University of Montreal in Canada. And <coughs> I'll give this course with my colleague, Daniel Borcar, as you know. And uh, <coughs> first, I would like to thank uh, <coughs> uh, the, uh, our guest, uh, Cosimo and Vinko, who have organized this, uh, this fantastic meeting. You know, there, are, there will be eventually 64 of you in the <coughs> on this side of the class, mm -hmm. and you are representing 24 different countries. I've never given a course to such a diversified, geographically diversified group of people. Actually, the idea of this <coughs> course started uh, when uh, we uh, met and discussed this idea during another conference in Toulouse two years ago. You know, this is the sort of time it takes to organize this sort of event. And uh, I'm very glad that thanks to your efforts, the two of you, uh, the, <coughs> this course came true. And now we are going to, to start it and see where it takes us. Uh, <coughs> Actually, in, uh, you may have been impressed by the amount of uh, material available on the web page. It is because everything is in double. I have the, prepared the material for the full course, and Dr. Barkar also has material for the full course. And we will each teach half of it. So everything is more or less in double. Uh, we have two different approaches. In my presentation, I may become a bit more mathematical at times. For those of you who like to know why it is that we are using this and that equation, and you will have a demonstration of that this morning, where I will describe principal component analysis, but insisting on the equation, the, the one equation that is at the basis of this sort of analysis, and then how we use it to represent our data. And later, uh, Daniel Barcar will uh, come back over, uh, well, other aspects of the same subject and will show you uh, more uh, about the applications, the interpretation, and things like that. So <coughs> uh, maybe some people here are interested in knowing that there is real mathematics behind these methods and others will be more interested in the application por portion. So there will be a bit for everyone in our uh, alternating presentations. So I started with this uh, slide, what is uh, numerical ecology, because uh, uh, <coughs> Cosimo was uh, kind enough to uh, show you the picture of the, of the books. Actually, I also have pictures of the same books in this presentation, but I may not have to go over them. And uh, so this uh, whole story started with the field of uh, the development of the field known as numerical ecology. And in this course here, we will go over some of the methods of numerical ecology and quickly move to the analysis of uh, spatial data, that is, <coughs> Uh, organisms and communities are spread in space, and uh, the second part of the course will insist on that, how to analyze these data that are multivariate. So here I say that uh, numerical ecology is the field of quantitative ecology. It is a portion of quantitative ecology devoted to the numerical analysis of ecological data that are, in a sense, multivariate because we have so many species and uh, with emphasis on community composition data. I could give the same sort of course to geneticists and just change community composition for, into a genetic composition, and the methods would be exactly the same. So here we are among community people, so I, <coughs> I use community composition data. And uh, community ecologists, our data are multivariate, uh, by nature, because we have many species and many environmental variables. So it is, it is impossible to analyze our data using uh, elementary statistical methods that deal with one variable or, in the case of correlation or simple regression, with two variables. We have one response data table, the species that may have hundreds or thousands of species, and we have another data table with the environmental variables that may have also many, many environmental variables. 
and the so community ecologists are the primary users of the method described in our books, but it, the methods are not limited to community ecologists. And uh, I understand that some of you uh, come from uh, <coughs> fields where there are maybe other types of biological data or even other types of data altogether, the oceanographers. And uh, so you may find some utility in the methods that will be described in this course. So uh, numerical ecology is not a bag of methods. It is a bag of ways of answering ecological questions. We're <coughs> if we uh, will discuss the, the mathematics of the methods, it is because we have real ecological questions. I'm not a mathematician. Daniel Bacar is not a mathematician. We are both ecologists. Okay? So we will speak from the point of view of ecologists, even though we will describe the methods, uh, hopefully, correctly. And so methods are chosen to answer questions, ecological questions, or in other fields, genetic questions, genomic questions nowadays, and to test ecological hypotheses about the data. And then I will have to, uh, I think it is uh, tomorrow or the day after, we'll, I will discuss statistical method, <coughs> testing methods that can be applicable to multivariate and essentially non-normal data. And we will see that such methods exist. They are the permutation tests that I will describe these tests. So I will quickly go through the, <coughs> the slides of this uh, slideshow that I, w I prepared for a completely different purpose. Uh, what do we have here? Nothing. Oh, <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> uh, we have something only there. Ah, there it is. Except that we lost the slideshow. How about that? This is typical of uh, Microsoft software. You know, it blows up unexpectedly. <clears throat> uh, yeah, this is where we were. Uh, let's see, foundation. I will skip that. Th this is the first uh, edition of, uh, of our book. What you see here is the fifth edition. We were, had two editions in French and three in English. So I will go to... All this. This is my, my co-author, Louis Legendre, who is an oceanographer. So for those of you who are oceanographers, there is a strong input of oceanography in our book. And this uh, was taken a few years back. <coughs> uh, yeah, then we had this development book, uh, the 1998 edition and the current edition. And uh, then here uh, in 2002, uh, at my brother's place in uh, Nice, we were discussing then the, the preparation of this uh, new edition. As you see, we do that very seriously. <laughs> and then came uh, Daniel Borcard, and, uh, who is the lead author on our book of Numerical Ecology with R. And uh, Daniel uh, worked very hard to publish that book in 2011 before the new edition of the Green Book, of the Numerical Ecology Book. Uh, if uh, he had not done that, I would have had to include the 300 pages of that book into the Green Book, which would have uh, taken the wheelbarrow to carry here. <laughs> so uh, all the R material is in the new book, is in this, uh, the, the orange book, as the, uh, the students in our lab call it. And uh, then in the Green Book, at the end of each chapter, there is simply one page refer referring to all the R uh, <coughs> the functions that, are, that can be called upon to uh, implement the methods described in the chapters. So it made the green book only a thousand pages long. And now, who are the authors of this orange book? Here they are. Well, you have Daniel Bacar uh, at, the, at the back of the room. I'm um, at the other end. And this man, François Gillette, you will meet him on Thursday and Friday. He will come here. And I will meet him on Thursday and Friday. I have never met him. 
<laughs> Nowadays, you can write books with people without uh, meeting them face to face. So it will be a pleasure for me to meet uh, François Gillette from Université de franche Côté. Okay? And of course, you may have found, or we will remind you about this, uh, <coughs> this uh, web page associated with the book, where do we distribute free of charge all the, ma the R material of the book in this updated material uh, folder, zip folder. It contains all the R code of the book. It contains all the new functions that we develop for the book. And it contains the data sets used in the book. So people don't have to buy the book. You can have all that free. And you will have uh, excerpts, portions of that material in the practical sessions prepared by Daniel Barcar for this course here. OK. Oh, and then, of course, if you speak Chinese, you can buy for a much lower price than the Springer edition. You can buy this, uh, the Chinese edition of the <coughs> Numerical Ecology with R book. Okay, that's about what I wanted to show you as a starter. So we won't need PowerPoint anymore. Uh, what else do I want to tell you? Well, the course outline, that's the next thing. <coughs> uh, in the course outline, you may have uh, looked at it. To today, we're going to talk about ordination, day one. And uh, <clears throat> I will uh, start by introducing principal component analysis. And after the coffee break, uh, Daniel uh, will do uh, sections two and three on transformation and order ordination methods. Tomorrow, we will talk first about measures of similarity and distance. And we will, uh, one of the important messages of the application of numerical ecology methods to community data is that everything is based on a measure of distance. And the measure of distance is very important, and it acts as a filter on the data. You have your data there, but then they can be filtered in different ways. They can be filtered by uh, distances that will transform them into presence absence, other distances that will uh, <coughs> norm the, uh, the rows of data so that the, the they are interpreted by the distance as if there was an equal number of individuals at all sites, or distances that take into account the differences in productivity of the sites. So you see that the choice of the distance that does this filtering will determine the outcome. And you may want to analyze your data in these three different ways, because they will answer different questions about the data. So we will talk about that tomorrow. And the idea is to come to here, canonical analysis. Canonical analysis contains, uh, is a combination of three different uh, groups of methods that we'll see here. It, it is based on multiple linear regression that is included in there. It is based also on ordination that is part of canonical analysis. And it, the, all the, the Hypothesis testing in canonical analysis is done by permutation test. So we need the material of today and tomorrow and this in order to understand canonical analysis. This course is cumulative. The, the different sections will finally build into something called canonical analysis that we will then use in days four and five to uh, <coughs> analyze the spatial structure of our data. Yes, here uh, I will finish uh, day number three with uh, two different applications of canonical analysis. Here on day four, we will talk about, we'll focus on beta diversity. I could have entitled the course beta Diver analysis of beta diversity, actually. This is the objective. And <coughs> we will see how this uh, can be done. And on day five, we will go into the more sophisticated methods of uh, spatial analysis that are based on canonical analysis and uh, the construction of these fancy uh, <coughs> variables to represent, the, to model the spatial structures called the Moran eigenvector maps. So this is the, the plan for the week. It will, uh, the complexity will increase, but hopefully by doing that step by step, 
every day you will have only a small step to, to go through because we will have gone through uh, and, uh, the more elementary steps in the first days. Okay? So that's the plan for the week. What does that mean? PowerPoint. Oh, yes, PowerPoint has failed. We noticed. Thank you. <laughs> uh, what is required uh, from you? <clears throat> I think uh, two things. Uh, it may have been uh, said, I hope it was said, uh, when uh, the course was first offered to you. Uh, it, it requires, on your part, uh, an understanding of the elementary statistical methods. Uh, I will assume that you know what a, co a correlation is or an uh, analysis of variance is. And also uh, ordinary uh, statistical tests. I will assume that you have some idea of how that works because we will build upon that to <coughs> present the material of this course here. Uh, <coughs> then uh, you come from a variety of different fields. And uh, we may not have examples it's, <coughs> it's directly suited to your field. So you will have to do the translation yourself, looking at the examples that we will present and try to adapt that to your own field to understand what is the correspondence. And uh, with that, I think I will go on with the first subject, which is what is ordination? <clears throat> so, ordination and principal component analysis. This is an ordination. <clears throat> okay. It, it, this is the, a very uh, important and interesting concept. Ordination is placing things, objects that are fruits here, in some sort of a reference space, in a diagram, uh, in which uh, the, or the, the objects are spread according to some axes. Here we only have two variables, and it is the difficulty of getting to the, what we want to eat in the fruit, and the sort of taste. Uh, here very tasty, that is sweet, and so on. And here the, the, the author wrote untasty, but it is something like lemon. Okay. And uh, in this uh, representation, if we have two variables, these two variables for each object, of course, we can plot a point for each of these objects, each, each of these fruits in the diagram. But, <coughs> and this is an elementary thing. You have done that in high school. Uh, but the, the interesting thing is that uh, objects, fruits, that end up being close to one another, they must have the same sort of characteristics for these two axes. Or if we ha are dealing, if we are working in a multivariate space, a space with many, many different variables, it will be the same thing. Things that are close must have close characteristics on these different axes. So the concept of distance comes into this. The distance measured by these different axes between objects that are close to one another, the distance must, must be small. And then for things that are very far, like uh, peaches and so on, compared to lemon and grapefruit, <coughs> if they are far in the diagram, it's because the distance between these two groups of fruit is large as measured by the variables that we are dealing with. So you see we have the concept of ordination right here. And contrary to other methods like clustering that may be very efficient at producing groups of objects but don't tell us anything about the relationships between that group and that group, here in an ordination, we have a general model, a model that applies to all the objects in the study. And uh, we know that uh, things that are close must be similar, and things that are far must be dissimilar. <coughs> uh, whereas in uh, clustering, you know that things that are in the same cluster must be close, but must be similar. But things that are far away, you don't know exactly uh, who is more uh, farther than uh, other groups. So ordination is very interesting, and this is why it has been used by ecologists for uh, at least half a century. 
Now, here is, this is a simple ordination with two axes. But what do we do when we have many axes? I will run an example for you where we have three axes. And this is in one of the documents that I gave uh, you on the web page. It is a script of a graphic rotation. Uh, the data, uh, I will show you the data a bit later. It is a data set that has been used by many authors to uh, illustrate methods or to, yeah, essentially to illustrate method. In the, it is a data set from the literature, from art and uh, co-authors from the Netherlands. They are hunting spiders from the, net, the, the Netherlands. There are 27 sites, I think, and 12 species of hunting spiders. But uh, that's not the point at the moment. I took these data, did some transformation, and so on. And I have them in, uh, <coughs> I have something here that is a summary of these data, a three-dimensional summary of the data in this uh, 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 object called spider's site that has 28, and, yeah, 28 sites and three objects, not 27 and three variables, sorry. These are artificial variables. So, so I prepared that last night so that it would be more quick today. Now I will open a window, which looks black at the moment. Let me put it a bit bigger, like this. And then the next thing will be to plot the points. I will plot them as a green point. You see color equals green. OK. Uh, where's my diagram? You see the points. But what's the meaning of these points? Let's add some axes. Here I had calculated the range of these axes. And I will plot lines corresponding to these three axes. I only have three axes. Uh, since I'm copying from a PowerPoint, it uh, copies these end of lines that I have to remove, otherwise R will not like it. Okay, now I have three axes. You see three axes? There are three axes. <coughs> Where are they? <coughs> we will put labels on the axes. Again, I remove the end of lines. Oops, not too much. I will label them axis one, axis two, axis three. Here we go. Where's the picture? Ah, axis one, axis two. Oh, and there is an axis three. Look at that. It's there. <laughs> and now we can play with that. Huh? We can rotate the points. And principal component analysis is essentially a rotation of the points. Now, what is the best rotation for these points? Would it be something like that, where we see that a bunch of points here and a separate group? Or would it be <coughs> something like this, where we see, uh, well, a bit of a strange structure? Or let's see, what else can we have? Something like that, where all the points are more or less uh, in a big ellipse? Well, it turns out that if we try all possible orientations of these points, you would probably agree that the best representation is probably this. It's better than anything else, because here, for instance, many points are in one row and one group is separate. But here is when we see <coughs> the best spread of the points. So we may choose that to uh, <coughs> represent our points, because here we see that there is a group here, a group there, another group, a uh, uh, loose group there, and one point in the middle. This is site number 25, by the way. I know it. <laughs> and so maybe this is the best uh, possible representation of our point. Sorry, I cannot uh, point uh, I, with two pointers. I'm pointing to this one. So <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and uh, actually, this turns out to be the representation uh, following axis one and axis two of a principal component analysis. But why do we say that it is the best representation? Any guess? 
why would that be better than when all the points are on, in one row, for instance? Yes. Uh, so what would be the statistical term to, to say that, that the points are more spread? Variance. Variance, right. So we want to, the points, the, this representation in two dimension to have the largest amount of variance. Ah, and now we go to statistics with the word variance. And I'll show you how we do that. Uh, before that, I can probably show you the correct representation of, uh, <clears throat> of these points I have here, the, the command to, yeah, by plot <coughs> of the output object of my principal component analysis. You will have the same spread of the points in the representation that I will produce here. bigger, maybe compare it to this. <coughs> the points are spread in the same way. You have <coughs> this group here that's there. This group is there. The, these uh, four sites, they are there. These four, well, four or five or six are there. And site 24, uh, 25 is here, you see. And in addition, here in principal component analysis, we have plotted the variables that are here, the species of spiders. And so we can interpret this graph uh, more completely than this one by saying, oh, by the way, these arrows here, they are centered at the mean value of, let's say, this species of spider. So this is the mean. The points on this side have values lower than the mean, and points on that side have values larger than the mean. So we may say that these, <coughs> the, these sites here are probably characterized by the fact that they have a larger abundance of these two species. Here, these sites have a larger abundance of that species, Pardosa lugubris is the name. <coughs> so <coughs> the terrible looking spider. <laughs> And, uh, and so on. You can interpret the position of the sites according to the abundance of the species, keeping in mind that if this, these sites have more of that species, then these sites have fewer, uh, a smaller abundance of that species because they are, if you extend that line on that side, then you are on the negative side of the abundances compared to the, the mean negative compared to the mean, okay? So they had fewer of this species on that side and more of that species on this side, and so on. So this is how we can handle multivariate data in a graph that is meaningful if and only if the variance, the amount of variance in the graph is fairly high compared to the total amount in the original data set. So now I'll spend the next few minutes showing you how we do that, how it is done, and what's the mathematics behind this exercise, OK? But if you understand the objective here, you understand the objective of ordination. Now I'm going to use a document uh, that is also on the web page called Algebra of Principal Component Analysis. This document also contains the algebra of the two other ordination methods that Daniel Barcar is going to describe after the coffee break, that is correspondence analysis and principal coordinate analysis. So you have the algebra of all these things later in this document, but I will not present them. Daniel will present these two methods in his own way. Uh, but you can come back to this document uh, <coughs> tonight to look at it. Uh, what are the nights for? Huh? <laughs> so you can use them, you know, to uh, com uh, complete your readings of uh, the material, the abundant material that we are showing you. Uh, here uh, I have a very simple example, so simple that usually we would not do a principal component analysis on an example of, like that, because I have five objects, one, two, three, four, five, and two variables only. 
two variables can be entirely represented in a graph with two axes. So there is no need for a principal component analysis. Still, I will do it in order to show you what principal component analysis does to your data in detail. So it is only a classroom example. It is not a real life example. The first step is to center the, the, the variables on their respective mean. You calculate the mean here, and you subtract it from each of these, the, these values, and you obtain this column of values. For the second column, you do the same thing, compute the mean, subtract it from each value, and there you go. So here, if you computed the mean of each column after the centering, the mean would be zero. And uh, we will use these uh, two uh, centered variables for the final representation, like for the species, uh, the spider species data. They were centered. It means that for their representation, the values were taken from this first transform matrix, which is simply centered. <coughs> then we compute the covariance matrix. That gives us the relationship between the two variables. Covariance is computed with the function cov in the R language. So if we compute cov of y or cov of that, we'll do the same thing. Uh, it produces this <coughs> small matrix. Uh, this is the equation for the, <coughs> for the covariance using y index c, that is the centered data. So we, the cov function does the centering, does the uh, scalar product, and divides by n minus 1, so that here and there, well, this matrix compares variables 1 and 2 to variables 1 and 2. If we had more variables, the covariance matrix would have the size of the number of variables. And here we have the two variances. <coughs> the covariance of var variable 1 with itself is the variance. And same thing for the variance of variable number 2. And this is the covariance of variable 1 versus 2, or 2 versus 1, which is the same value, of course. Uh, so we have uh, the basic information on which principal, the algebra of principal component analysis is going to operate. What we will do then is put this S covariance matrix into this, let, let's say for the moment, uh, the magic equation of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Uh, I could explain how it works, but it would take another 45 minutes to explain that in detail. So either you already know about that, or you don't care, or you may want to learn uh, after this presentation, but today I don't have time to explain why this equation works uh, as it is written. But then it is a, a bit strange for an equation because the only known thing is the matrix of covariance, S. And then in this equation, you have a lot of strange things. You have eigenvalues represented by the Greek letter lambda. You have I, which is an identity matrix, a matrix that a square matrix, the same size as S, with ones on the diagonal. And then you have an eigen, a, a vector here called an eigenvector associated with this eigenvalue. This is a pair of information that comes out. And this is a vector of zeros. So with one thing known, we will try to find out two different things, the eigenvalue and eigenvector. And there are as many eigenvalues as there are variables. So this equation here, because there are two variables, it will produce two eigenvalues. And to each one, there is an eigenvector associated, so two eigenvectors. Here are the, the two eigenvalues, and here are the two eigenvectors that will be produced by that. And uh, yes, this equation <coughs> will work, even though there are more unknown than known things. Uh, <coughs> we will use this equation repeatedly in this uh, course. <clears throat> because we will apply principal component analysis repeatedly, or it will be used also in the next two ordination methods that Daniel Bacar is going to present. So if we just call the function eigen in R and put the eigen, we say eigen parentheses S, we obtain the two eigenvalues, 9 and 5, 
and we obtain the two eigenvectors that are here. 9 and 5, why these two numbers? And uh, are they interesting? If you add them up, 9 and 5 makes what? Yes, it makes 14, you can say. And then if you came back to this covariance matrix and say 8.2 plus 5.8, how much does that make? 14, yes. And it will always be like that. The sum of the eigenvalues will always be the sum of the variances. So the method of principal component analysis will take all the, all the variances of all the variables. Here there are only two. Put them together, shake them, and decompose them again in the same number of values. There were two. We have two here. But, but the sum here will be the same as that. But it will be reorganized differently. These will be the, <coughs> the, the eigenvalues will give us the spread of the observations on the new axes produced by the principal component analysis. But that spread in the two new dimension will be a equal to the spread along the original variables. That's the relationship. Here is already a very, very important point that I can make. I was saying that we add these two variances and decompose them again in something that has the same sum. Isn't there a condition to be able to add two things? What can you think? <clears throat> As the saying goes in English, they say that we cannot add apples and oranges. Here, can we add two variables that would be uh, one in milligrams per liter and the other one in Celsius? Can we add them? It would produce a very strange hybrid <laughs> if we added them. Well, we cannot add them. Or at least, if, if you do, it is totally meaningless because your milligrams per liter could very well be expressed in some other units, in kilograms per liter. Uh, uh, and then the Celsius could be uh, transformed into Fahrenheit or into uh, absolute degrees. The, the, the scales would be completely changed. And the addition of the two variables or the two variances would be completely different. So do we want a method that will produce anything we, we like just by changing the, the scales? We don't want that. We, we want a method that will produce something repeatable. Yes? So the rule here is that we can only add two variances if the variables are in the same physical units. Why is that? Well, if you have a variable, a variable that is in, uh, let's see, uh, degrees Celsius, then, <coughs> well, it, my choice of uh, wording is bad. I should not have written var. I should have written y. <coughs> because now I want to compute the variance of y, and the variance of y will be in degrees Celsius squared. The variance is as units related to the units of the original variable. So that the standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance, will be in the same units as that. Okay. So variances have units, and you can add variances only if they have the same units, so if the original variables are in the same units. And that leads to uh, <coughs> a necessary step. If you have variables that are not in the same physical units, right at the beginning of a principal component analysis, you have to remove the physical units. You have to standardize your variables. And Daniel Bacar is going to talk about that at the beginning of his presentation of transformations. This is the most uh, current, the most basic transformations that we can make to data, is to standardize them. We do that only for variables that are not in the same physical units, like <coughs> physical or chemical variables of the water, of the soil, of the air, and so on. We don't do that 
when we have species data, because species data are all counts. And if we standardize the species data, then the uh, rare, uh, the rare species uh, with uh, very small abundances would have, after, after standardization, the same variance as the most abundant species that have big numbers. And we don't want that either. So the rule is, if species have different physical units, you standardize them. If they are all in the same units, like species counts or fr frequencies in genetics, you don't standardize them. And this is one of the most uh, <coughs> frequent mistakes that beginners make. They forget to standardize the species, or they standardize everything. <coughs> so this has to be done in a parsimonious way, in a surgical way. You have to standardize only when needed. OK, where do, are we now? We have obtained these eigenvalues. And then we obtain these eigenvectors. And when they come out of the function eigen, the eigenvectors are scaled to a, a length of 1, meaning that the, the length of a vector is the sum of the squares of the, the values. And then you take the square root. So you square this plus this squared, and you take the square root or not, and you obtain 1. Same thing there. And it will be the same thing for all eigenvectors that come out of the function eigen. They are presented in that way. That is a, a standard way. <clears throat> and then you can do what is required by the method with them. But at least you know that in the beginning, they are like that. And we have almost everything we need now to obtain the representation that I showed you with the spider data. Our five points here in two variables will be represented in this graph called the biplot. Biplot because there are two types of information, the points and the variables. Uh, the position of the points first is obtained by a, a final matrix product, where we take the centered data. This is the matrix that was at the top of the screen there, but now it is above the ceiling. These are the centered data multiplied by the matrix of eigenvectors. This matrix of eigenvectors actually produces a rotation of the points. All these values can be interpreted geometrically, geometrically as rotation factors. They are actually uh, rotation cosines. The, these are the, uh, the cosines of the angles of the rotation. And uh, <clears throat> by doing that, we obtain the matrix that I call F in my book and in this presentation, which is here, that we use for plotting. If we had more than two variables, this matrix would have more columns. But here in this simple example, it has only two columns. And the function here has two different scales. And now we look at the black scale here and there. Sorry, it come, does not come out completely clearly uh, with the projection, uh, where we plot these values. Point number one here is at position minus 3 point something here, and 0 here. So that's point number one. Point number two is at minus 1.34, something like this, and 2.236. Here it is. Point number three is at the same position, but lower. Point number four is at 3.13 here and 2.236. And point number five is here. Okay, So the points are plotted from the values obtained from this matrix multiplication. Now, we could use directly the eigenvectors to plot our species data, we want to know where the original variables are after this rotation. And this is given by this. So since if this is eigenvector number one, eigenvector number two, the first row corresponds to the first species the se or variable, the second row to the second variable. We could use that for plotting, point 89 and minus 
0.89 would be about here, and minus 0.44, it would give us a very small vector here. And the second row would give us a very small vector for variable 2. So this function used for plotting blows up these values so that the, uh, the length of we would see the, the vectors. Otherwise, they would be too small to be seen in the graph. It doesn't matter, actually. I told you that these eigenvectors are scaled to length of 1. It's because the, these eigenvectors, they are actually infinite vectors. And in this representation, if we change the length of the vectors, it would change also the, the tip of the arrows. And the arrows can be as long as we want. So they are rescaled here and plotted according to the red tick mark that you have there and there. Uh, <clears throat> so that the, uh, we can see them with respect to the spread of the points. It is a very fancy thing to spread them just enough, but not too much. Because if you spread the variables too much, then it is the points that will be shrunk in the middle of the graph. It is a tricky thing to do. But this function does it very well. It is one of the functions available in the, uh, stat, uh, <coughs> the, <coughs> the stat package of R. And uh, there we go. We have the variables and the, the points uh, with, re uh, with respect uh, to them. So we can see the, that variable 1, uh, the positive values bring point number 5 far in that direction. And we can check that. If we want, <coughs> yeah, variable 1, point number 5, has the highest value here. And the lowest value was for point number 1, which would be in the other direction. See, point number 1 and number 2, actually, they have values lower than the mean. The centered values are here. So values lower than the mean, they are here. And this is what we see. So these values, uh, or actually, yeah, these values, they are the values of the points projected on this. If you extend this line and project point number one, point number two, point number three, you have the ordination of the points along the centered variable, exactly. So it is a complex geometric representation, complex because the data are multivariate here bivariate, and in the case of our data, they may be as multivariate as we want. Several of you will have hundreds of species or even thousands of species, but we can do exactly the same thing with them. Okay, that's the, uh, <coughs> the mathematics of principal component analysis. So in summary, what have we done? We took our points that were represented by variables number one and two. We centered the variables. That is, they are now represented with respect to these dashed variables that are the centered variables, the centroid being here. And with the principal component analysis, we obtain this representation. This is the exact same representation as in the, uh, the, the biplot that I showed you before. So what's the relationship between this and that? This is actually a rotation. Here you have the, uh, the, the rotation it, that preserves exactly the position of the points. With respect to these uh, axes, the points are exactly like here. And with respect to these axes, the points are exactly like there. So after this rotation, we have not changed the distances between the points. We have just rotated the points. That's all we have done. Okay, so we say that principal components analysis uh, <coughs> respects or represents uh, the, uh, the distances among the points given by the Euclidean distance formula. We will discuss distances tomorrow. Now, there, <coughs> this is actually only the first way of representing the results of a principal component analysis. Uh, there have been uh, very long discussions in the literature as to the different ways of representing the results of principal component analysis. And uh, the, the, the question 
has been uh, settled and for ecological data or genetic data, uh, what we <coughs> usually do is either this or that representation. This is the representation that we saw on the previous slides where the points uh, are in this rot rotated space of principal components and uh, with the preservation of their Euclidean distances among the space, among the points. And of course, we reconstruct the values of the, of the points on the centered variable by our, an orthogonal projection of the point on axis one and axis two, for instance. So it gives us exactly the original centered data. But then there is another representation that can be used and it is a representation, in, in this representation, the variables are at right angle, are still at right angle. Uh, in the multidimensional space, they may not look at the right angle, but in a simple case like this, where there are only two axes, two variables, they are at right angle in the graph also. Uh, if you have 10 variables, they will be at right angle, but in the graph in 10 dimensions. Now, in this representation, we sacrifice the orthogonality in order to represent the relationships among the variables. And here, we want two variables that are strongly correlated to be not at right angle, but an, at an angle that is smaller and smaller as the correlation increases. If the correlation reaches one, then the two variables come together. Okay? This is what we want there. And there will be cases where we want that with our ecological data. But by doing that, if the points follow, they will not uh, keep their Euclidean distances among the points. We will change the, the distances among the points. And uh, for those of you who like fancy uh, statistical statements, we will say here that the points are now at in distances called Malanobis distance. Well, we have people from India here. So Malanobis was the great uh, <coughs> founder of the School of Statistics in India. So Malanobis space is a space where the variables are not at right angle, but at an angle that is modified. And this is done uh, mathematically in this way. For the left representation, the distance by plot that preserves the distances, also called scaling one in computer software. For the objects, we saw on the previous page, on the first page, that for the objects, we use the matrix F. And for the variables, we use the matrix U. U. This is what we had on the first page. For, to obtain scaling two, called the correlation by plot, for the objects, we modified the matrix F by multiplying it by the <coughs> matrix of uh, eigenvalues. We had this matrix of eigenvalues here, <laughs> lambda, capital lambda, which has had the eigenvalues 9 and 5, and then 0 and 0. Okay? So here we have first to put this matrix to the exponent minus 1 half. <coughs> uh, 1 half is the square root. And minus is 1 over. So lambda to the exponent point minus 1 half would be <coughs> uh, 1 over square root of 9, 1 over square root of 5, and 0, 0. OK? And so for the diagonal values, we take the square root and then 1 over that because of the minus. So this matrix is now used to multiply f in the scalar product, and we obtain the position of the objects in the right-hand graph. And for the variables, we use now lambda to the exponent 1 half. <coughs> which is simply the square root of 9, which is 3, and the square root of 5. <coughs> And this is what is used to multiply u here to obtain the position of the variables in the right-hand graph. And uh, <coughs> uh, the people have finally agreed 
because these two representations follow uh, a rule <coughs> uh, that says that with each pair f and u or g and u scaling 2, we have to be able to reconstruct the objects. By multiplying f by u transpose, we obtain uh, y, uh, I should have had the, the centered here, or centered y. And if we multiply g by this transpose, we also obtain y. So we put together in one representation the two elements that allow us to reconstruct entirely the, <coughs> uh, the uh, original centered data. This rule was proposed by a statistician called Ruben Gabriel. And uh, so these are the two basic representations of principal component analysis. Here in the end out, you can look at that uh, later. I have another example where I added a third variable to show you that it, it works also with three variables. And uh, I would like to uh, complete my, yeah, with three variables. We have the, the, the representations uh, according, fo following axis one and two, and then axis one and three. You have the, the projections of the variables and all that for scaling one and then for scaling two. And the code to produce all these pictures is shown here. You have all these four biplots that are produced here. You, if you want to try it later, and you are welcome to do that. That is a nice, uh, small exercise. OK, data transformations, I will leave that to Daniel Borcar after the coffee break. And uh, I would like to terminate by showing you simply two applications of, of this, of this method. Uh, one where we need scaling type 1, the distance by plot, and one where we need a scaling type 2. Let's see. Example, scaling type 1, type 2. Uh, let's see, what is this? Yes, OK. This is a picture from the thesis of uh, Marc Dufresne, an entomologist from uh, Belgium, who worked on the carabid, carabids of uh, Belgium. So we sampled the uh, carabid uh, species all over Belgium, and these are the sites that where he did his sampling. And uh, then on <coughs> the, these two axes, they account for, uh, uh, I don't remember how many species, but there were many species. Oh, no, sorry. This is not from the species data. This graph is from the chemistry of the soil. Ah, yes, that's right. So we have uh, uh, pH and then calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and phosphorus. Here, all these variables have been log transformed. And uh, actually, he decided to plot the variables as uh, small pictures separate from the main one because we would not have seen the variables too clearly. There are too many points. The, so this is always a, a possible choice. Instead of plotting the variables right on here, you can plot them in a separate picture. But for interpretation, uh, he also drew on the top of that ellipses corresponding to the types of uh, environments where the is insect traps had been placed. So uh, mineral lands or uh, uh, peat bogs or uh, <coughs> Uh, other types of uh, environment, alluvial plains, and so on. And he plotted the ellipses. But this is not done by the principal component analysis. What I want to show you is the relationship between that and that. In this graph, uh, the variables that are pointing, like here, uh, sodium, uh, phosphorus, and so on, they correspond, uh, the high values of these variables correspond to the points that are here. So it means that for these two variables, for instance, low values are found in the points that are found there. 
Don't forget that these are infinite axes that go in the negative as well as the positive side. And <coughs> so low values, high values. In that direction, we have higher pH, higher calcium. And so in this direction, we have lower pH, lower calcium. And here he used uh, scaling type 1 in this representation because he wanted to show us something about the points and then how they relate to the original variables. But he did not try to represent the variables uh, according to their correlations. It, here it is only the projection of these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six variables in two dimensions that projects them at the angles that seem to be not uh, right angles, but they are right angles in a space with six dimensions. There are other cases where we want to represent the variables in a space according to their correlations. This is an example from a paper of mine where we looked at species associations. You, and, but I just want to show you this final picture of the paper. I will not describe in detail the, the method of uh, analysis of species associations here. Uh, how can I make that a bit bigger? Well, <coughs> yeah, uh, OK. Maybe 125, 150, but perhaps. Yes, that's good. <coughs> So here, I, and th this is one of the data sets with which you are going to work. It is one of the two data sets used in the <coughs> orange book here. And actually, it is a data set collected by Daniel Bacar himself. They are oribatted mites in, uh, <coughs> at uh, 70 uh, uh, soil cores taken in, the, in a peat uh, in, in the mat, a pit mat of a pit bog. Uh, and we will show you the sampling design uh, during the, the practicals. Uh, the story here is that we, I represented in this graph a principal component analysis of the species with scaling type 2 because we were looking for species associations. And we want species that are strongly correlated to come together. Okay? And <coughs> This, uh, actually, this picture represents 38% of the variance of these. There are 35 species. So having 38% of the variance in two dimensions is quite good. You know, it is a lot a high proportion of the variance. And you see that the species that have small angles here, they are strongly associated. And they are opposite, of course, to species that are on the other side. And when I looked at the species associations in this uh, data set, it is used as uh, an example in this paper, the species that are represented with squares, they are members of one association. And the species represented with circles, they are members of another association. <coughs> so that is a case where we want to use scaling type 2 with community composition data. Uh, I think I may stop. Uh, stop about here. You will see more of that, of course, during the practicals this afternoon. And we can go to coffee break. Okay. And we start again in at uh, 15 yeah, 15 minutes. Good. <laughs>